So uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me and for organizing this, despite all the uh, obstructions in their way. Um, and uh, I want to start just by talking. This is the uh, I saw this paper of Sasha's when I was in graduate school, and it is it is inspired a very large portion of my career. Um, and in particular, this conjecture. I'm going to tell you what the conjecture is right now. I just wanted to to draw the diagram, and I know that. Almost none of the objects in here are probably known to everybody. So I'm, we'll tell everybody what all the pieces are. But I did want to just show this. These are completely unconnected things. So I want to start by just vaguely talking about these conjectures. Oh. Um, so I, would, I just want to talk about that. I mean, the real numbers, hopefully everybody knows what it is, volume is a volume there's going to be polytopes floating around. These are going to be hyperbolic polytopes. So this is a chain complex. So the just chain complex concentrated in degrees zero through n minus one. And with apologies to Sasha and all the algebraic geometers, everything is graded homologically uh, because I'm a topologist. And so everything is homological. Um, uh, so this is not how it appears in the paper. In the paper, it's done cohomologically. I just regraded it so that it would be homological. Um, and it is made out of hyperbolic polytopes. And I will discuss exactly how in a minute, but I just want to say this side is very geometric. You have hyperbolic polytopes. You cut them up into pieces. You take abelian groups generated by these, and you construct the chain complex out of this. And so this side is extremely geometric. This is algebraic K theory, which, because we're working rationally, I'm suppressing because there's not an infinite amount of space on this blackboard. I'm suppressing everything is rational. Everything is tensored with the rationals. There's no integral phenomena whatsoever. So this is algebraic K theory, which is pretty much the homology of BGL of the complex numbers. So this is the infinite general linear group considered as a discrete group. And you take its homology. This is a particular grading. This is the this is the associated graded of the gamma filtration. There's a particular filtration on K theory. It's defined very algebraically. Um, and this is just a twisting factor that I'm going to ignore. You have complex conjugation, which acts on C and therefore acts on the K theory, and therefore acts on this whole part. And we're taking the negative one eigenspace of that action. So this side is extremely algebraic. And there's a thing called the Borel regulator, which maps this to R. And the conjecture is first off that this exists for all i, and that it's an isomorphism. Um, and this is interesting on both sides of the map. So on this side, there's a big conjecture called the valence and Soleil conjecture, which says that the for every k group the Get the bits of the gamma filtration only appear in degrees sort of n over two through n. So in degree, if uh, so, if this is true, if this is an isomorphism, because this only appears in degrees zero through n minus one, this would say that only the groups ranging from zero to two n ish have nth graded pieces. So if this is true, this is interesting on the K theory side because it proves this big conjecture. But it is also interesting on the polytope side because if this is true, then it answered, then it gives us a solution to the generalized Hilbert's third problem for hyperbolic geometry. So Hilbert's third problem famously asked if you have two polyhedra with the same volume, can you always cut up 
cut one up into polygonal pieces, poly, well, polyhedral pieces, and rearrange them to make the other one. And the answer turns out to be no, there's a second invariant called the Dane invariant. And, but once you have that, that's enough. Two, if two polyhedra have the same volume and the same Dane invariant, then you can do this. This is called scissors congruence. Two things are congruent after you cut them up into pieces with scissors. Um, and in three dimensions, this is known. And in other geometries in three dimensions, this is kind of known. It's pretty much known. But above dimension five, by the way, the even dimensions are not interesting. Um, I'm going to skip talking over them entirely. This is apparently traditional at this conference, so most people shouldn't object. We're only talking about the odd dimensions. Every odd dimension, every time you go up, you get an extra Dane invariant. So five dimensions will have two Dane invariants, so on and so forth. I'll discuss those in a little bit more detail later so that folks can see how those work. But uh, the, in higher dimensions, it is not known whether volume and the Dane invariants determine scissors congruence classes. Um, and so the, when in degree n minus one, so when i equals n minus one, well, I slightly lined this bit is really only when i equals n minus one, and this is when i equals n minus one. But when i equals n minus one, this homology group is just the intersection of the kernels of all of the Dane invariants. That's all it is. And so volume ought to be the only invariant left. So when i is n minus one, this map should be injective, which is what we want to show. If this were an isomorphism, it would mean that the volume map is the same as the Borel regulator map. And while Borel regulator is not known to be injective, it is known to be injective in, very, in many, many cases and sort of expected that regulators in general are injective. And so uh, it would transform this geometric problem into a purely algebraic problem where the answers, we sort of, we have a, an expectation of what the answer should be. And regardless, it would show the equivalence of those problems. So this set of conjectures is interesting sort of on both sides. And I also want to mention that uh, Sasha proved that when, again, in the I equals N minus one case here, if you replace C with Q bar, to show that this map exists. Um, and, and that the triangle commutes. So in the case where instead of working with all polytopes, we have to work in this case with the ones with the algebraic vertices, if you do that, then this is that part of this is known. I can't prove this conjecture. I'm not just spoiling. There's not going to be any proofs of this conjecture. Uh, in this talk, but what I want to talk about is sort of how I might go about changing this problem a little bit in order to make it slightly more tractable and also to tell you what I can prove about it once the problem is changed. So several changes. First off, so the gamma filtration, which I haven't actually told you what it is, is uh, defined algebraically in terms of Adams operations, which often exist on K-theory, but are difficult to analyze. I want to change it to the rank filtration. And this one is fairly easy to define. We have that from the homology of BGLN to the homology of BGL, just given by including the n by n matrices into the infinite ones by padding them with you know with identity and the image of this is the nth rank part. So as usual, the the graded the nth graded part will be the the quotient of the nth rank part to the nth minus first rank part. So this is just a, a very sim a simpler thing to define, and also it is known that if F is a number field, then the n graded part of the K theory for the gamma filtration is the same as the nth graded part for the rank filtration. And the rank conjecture says this is actually always true. So we're pretty Yes, thank you. Um, so this is not, it's, it, it's expected to always be true. This is the right conjecture. So replace it with 
the rank filtration is not a huge change. The other big difference is this is the homology of BGL. And this involves polytopes and their isometries, which is an orthogonal group. And it is not the case that the, orthog the homology of the orthogonal group knows everything about the homology of the general linear group. There's more information in general linear matrices. There's a map that compares them called the hyperbolic map, and especially rationally, they are not terribly far apart. So what I want to do is I want to replace BGL with BO, and I'm going to put one, by, and by this I mean limit of O of N1 as N goes to infinity. So these, hi these hyperbolic isometries. Now, when we're working over the complex numbers, as the conjecture says, it doesn't matter which orthogonal group you take. You might as well take any one that you like. They're all isomorphic. And there's various comparisons there between them. But I'm going to be working with this one because I'm actually going to be talking about the real case um, more than I'm going to be talking about the complex case. So, um, so we want to take the co limit of these. I'm going to make a comment about the complex case later, but mostly I'm going to be focusing on the real case. And so these are the changes. Hopefully, these are not very large changes. And theorem, which is what I'm going to be talking about. Joint work with Jonas and Campbell. So the theorem is this. I'm going to be putting the delta on here to remind folks that this is a discrete group. I'm going to see Okay, so the theorem is that this map theta exists. So the theorem says that this exists and that this diagram commutes. And this is the Cheeger Chern Simons regulator. This agrees with Borel up to a factor of two. And moreover, if instead of n minus one, we put an i, this changes to an i, and this changes to an n plus i, and then this, this exists. The bottom no longer makes sense, but the top line still exists. So this is what I want to talk about. Um, I did mention that I need to change Borel to a different regulator that works for O instead of GL, but that sort of makes sense. You need to do that. And it's so, okay. So this is the theorem. So now that we've gotten here, I want to talk about what this uh, geometric side means that I haven't really been talking about. Okay, let's see if I can do this. So what is this geometric sum? So the idea here is that you have polyhedra in or polytopes in, hyper, in large dimensional hyperbolic geometry, and you want to analyze how they're put together. Um, I can't draw hyperbolic things, so I'm always going to be drawing Euclidean things. I can actually barely draw polyhedra, so I really am only going to be drawing tetrahedra. You should imagine that I'm drawing general things when I draw tetrahedra. Um, and I'm just going to show you how the Bain invariant works in three dimensions, and then I'll discuss how to generalize to higher dimensions. So suppose you have a polyhedron. We want to make an invariant that will remain the same if the polyhedron is cut up into pieces. The volume is long. We don't want volume. We want something that measures sort of how all the angles add up in order to make this thing close up. 
because a polyhedron isn't just a bunch of stuff, it's a bunch of stuff that closes up nicely. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the following. We're going to sum up over the edges. Subdivision closes up. No, 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 because a polyhedron closes up nicely. Uh, it, it's a solid volume bounded by its boundary. You take the length of the edge, closer with the dihedral angle at the edge. And the way that you can imagine this is, for instance, if we're looking at this edge here, the way that we measure the angle is that we take a very small circle orthogonal to the edge sort of centered around it and we look at where the polyhedron slices it and actually that's very small i don't know if you can see but i'll draw a zoomed in version we have the edge and then we have the small circle that intersects the polyhedron sort of here's the edges of the polyhedron and we have a small circle orthogonal to the edge that's intersecting the interior of the polyhedron here. And this is the angle. And this is the invariant, it doesn't change if you cut it up. And it lives inside Let's pretend this was hyperbolic. Um, and we want it to be mod some kind of circle because when you cut up a polyhedron, you're going to make new edges in the middle of the faces, and you so it's going to, but the angles around those are going to add up to pi. So you're going to want those to cancel out. So you want to quotient out by this or something along these lines. So here's another way of thinking about this. What? S1. Um, I'm not, well, that's a good point. I should say what, this, what these are. So in general, if you have some geometry, P of that geometry is the free abelian group generated by polytopes in that geometry. Modulo two relations, first off, the union of two of them is the sum if they only intersect on the boundary. So the intersection has measure zero. So it says I can take a polyhedron, I can slice it. And also, two things are equal if they're congruent. So it doesn't matter if I move a polyhedron, it's the same generator. So this works for any kind of nice geometry where you can define a polytope and you have a nice notion of isometry. So this is the geometry of hyperbolic line. This is the geometry of the circle. And we quotient out by the subgroup generated by half circles. But now you can see that you can write this in any kind of geometry where you actually have a, a notion of all of these things. So you can define a generalized data variant. A hyperbolic group. Minus one. That you ignore all right? So over Q, right? Uh, over Z. Over Z. I mean, it, it'll work because uh, these are all divisible. Well, glossing over everything, it's going to be, if, if it's Euclidean, these are going to be uh, actually real vector spaces. And so it doesn't matter whether you take Z or Q. In general, we actually care about doing it over Q, tensoring everything with Q and ignoring all torsion issues. Conjecturally, there's no torsion issues, but uh, it's actually going to be over Q, and I'm going to just, as I said, completely ignore that. Um, I'm tensoring everything with Q. 
Okay, so you can do this. And there's only one issue, which is I'm lying to you when I say that this lives in spheres. Because if you look at the three dimensional example, I had to quotient out by half circles. There's going to be a more general thing I'm going to need to quotient out by. And I'm going to draw this reduction there and completely ignore telling you what it is. It's going to tell you it's whatever you need to quotient out to make this thing well defined. If you want, you can look at you can play around with the generators or you can talk to me later. You quotient out by a bunch of things to make this actually well defined up to scissors congruence. Okay, so fun fact. E I and D J commute past each other. So you can do this by picking a tetrahedron, which generate everything and playing around with it. But for now, I'm going to tell you, and when I start to apologizing, the definition is actually just going to show you that it has to. Um, so for now, I'm just going to treat it like a fact. And what this means is that we can draw a cube of these. So in the dimension, for instance, when in the case where n was three, so we're looking at five dimensional hyperbolic things. We have five dimensional hyperbolic things. Each map by D1 to map to the one dimensional tensor three dimensional. Or we can map to the three dimensional tensor the one dimensional. You can check by running the definition appropriately that you can define a Dane invariant on the reduced version as well. So both of these are going to map to P of H1 tensor P of S1 tensor P of S1. And now you have to stop because you have no more Dane invariants that you can apply. And now we can define. Why uh, do you have to go by uh, so it's pretty much because this group is going to be zero whenever the dimension is even. And so you can put them in. And in fact, in the topological version, we want to put them in for reasons that I'll hopefully get to. But there's, you're not going to get anything interesting. It's just going to be a zero. And so, I mean, you can define it, but it's kind of boring. But the definition works. It's all well defined. It's just that they're not interesting. Definition is that this chain complex is the complex of this cube. cube? Well, this is a two-dimensional cube. Uh, in general, it's going to be an n minus one dimensional cube. Um, so for three, there was a single one. So that's a one-dimensional cube. Um, chain complex is kind of boring in that situation, but you can still do it. So you can see it's going to be concentrated in degrees zero through n minus one. Um, so that's the chain complex right up there. And all of this is really measuring is how can we decompose this polytope into sort of faces and what's orthogonal to that face. You can also think of it sort of locally as you take your face and you orthogonally project away from that face to just see sort of what's orthogonal to it near it. So now we want to compute the homology. And I don't know about you, but when I first saw this, I found the, 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 the idea of computing the homology of this thing extremely intimidating. Because you have this group that is uh, uncountably generated with uncountably many relations that are geometric and I don't know, geometry is scary. Um, and then you have these maps that are extremely difficult to work with that live inside these uncountably generated tensor products. And then you want me to compute the homology of something to do with this. So this is extremely intimidating. And so what Jonathan and I set out to do was we wanted to put off taking homology for as long as possible. So the idea is to try to write down all of these things without taking homology, to write down a topological model of this phenomenon and to only do the homology at the very, very end. And so a lot of what I'm gonna be telling you about is just sort of starting from everything. How do you construct this topologically? And then how do you construct the chain complex topologically? And then how do you take 
the total homotopic cofiber topologically. And the idea is that every step, we don't actually take homology anywhere. We just have the topological model and let it keep all of the information for us. Why do you need to take cofiber? Um, because the question of what the total complex is, that's going to be the total homotopy cofiber of the cube. But I'll get to that. Yes? Sorry, just to clarify the grading, you're saying that like the top thing is the n minus 1 grading, but the top left thing? Yes, so this is 0, this is 1, this is 2. Everything is homologous. Okay, so goal, homogenize everything. So there's going to be sort of three steps to this. The first step is to topologize this. And the second step is to topologize this. And the third step is to topologize this, or really sort of this part, because this is the third part. And then hopefully be able to say something about the result. Okay, so let's do step one. How do you topologize that group? So we don't want to just take the classifying space because that won't give us any more data. But I'm going to rewrite down the definition. This is the free abelian group on polytopes. Modulo these two relations. So the first observation is that I can rewrite this. I have the uh, congruence is done using a group action. So I can rewrite this as P equals G acting on P for G inside the isometry group. Uh, two um, and so you can see that this relation is equivariant with respect to this group action. So this is actually, I could st have stopped here and I could have called this P of H 2N minus one with the trivial group acting on it. And then the whole thing is H zero of O two N minus one one with coefficients in P of H two N minus one one. So we already have a homology in here. And I'm a homotopy theorist, so I see H zero and I go, that should be really be a star or even better, just a space. So the first step is to look at this group and to find a topological space where that is a convenient homology group. We know what that space is. Okay. And this is going to be a slightly strange space. For those of you who have seen Keith's building, this is a space closely related to a Keith's building. But here's a slight modification of it. So I'm going to do this for just a general geometry. So if X is a geometry, and by this I mean spherical or hyperbolic or Euclidean, honestly. We're going to define the RT building this is going to be a simplicial set with I simply 
are regions of subspaces from numbered from zero to i. So these are subspaces. So in the hyperbolic case, there's a hyperbolic subspace, the Euclidean case, the Euclidean subspaces, whatever geometry you want. Spherical case, there's spherical subspaces. And we want ui to equal x. And when we want u0 to be not empty. So this is halfway between a Tietz building, which has not empty proper subspaces, and a Rodness type building that he studies where u0 has to e be empty and ui has to equal the whole thing. So it's sort of this weird unbalanced thing. Um, and the fact, and I think this is due to deposit, or if it's not, please tell me so I can cite the appropriate person, but this is the first place I saw it, is that, uh, that the n minus first homology of this is the same as the scissor congruent group. And this is this one with the trivial isometries, no isometries, just just the decompositions. So this is, I mean, this is the Solomon Keats theorem. But DuPont was the place where I saw it related to scissors congruence groups first. Please do tell me if this is not the correct citation. So the one says that we are no not allowed to move things. Yes. You can actually you can see that you can do this for any group, but we're only going to be working with the full group, which I'm just omitting in the trivial group. But you can do this for any subgroup of the isometry group. But really, it doesn't even need to be isometry, it can just be anything that acts on the polygon. <coughs> But this initial set is a matrix obvious. So, yeah, so, okay, so this is a pointed commercial set, meaning there's also a base point. The face maps remove the appropriate i, and if it becomes an invalid simplex, you get collapsed to the base point. This is sort of the usual kind of thing that you do for these things. And all other homology groups are zero. So this is a topologization of this group. And H0 is sort of the home the orbits under the group action of this group. If we want to do it topologically, we want to take the homotopy orbits. So what that morally says is instead of collapsing an entire orbit, you sort of co connect it with higher dimensional things so that in the in the topology, you can see that they're connected, but there's actually higher invariants present. And so the isometry group of X acts on the space, and the appropriate topological topologization of the scissors congruence group is the homotopy co-invariance. I'll write this down. Then P of X is uh, this. Oh, sorry. This H N minus one. And here, the dimension of x is x. So as you know, with the teeth building, for those who've seen, it's usually hn minus 2. But because we have this extra anchoring, it suspends it. And so you get an hn minus 1. Oh, sorry. I didn't write it. This is where you take the homotopy orbits. So this is the sort of appropriate thing, but it also contains higher information. This has more information than just the scissors congruence group because this space actually contains not just H zero, it contains all of the homology groups of the isometry group of X acting on. So, so this has more information it can keep track of more interactions between things. Then your isometric sign. Oh. Yeah. No, no. So here it's the whole thing, but I'm also slightly lying. I want to I want to say this, and then I want to say how I'm lying. 
So this is sort of what one would want because this is the one thing that feels most natural. I also very quickly want to say that if you're working spherically, this gives you the correct reduced group. So when you when you're working with a reduced group, this is this is still the correct model. So the issue is this: when I have an orientation reversing isometry, I still want that to give me the same polytope, and this is really important because if you try to do things signed, it turns out that all scissors congruence groups are zero. Because if you take the angle bisectors of a simplex, you split it into pairs of orientation reversed, but, uh, but uh, congruent simplices. And this works in all geometries. And so uh, all the three major ones anyway. And so if you try to do this signed, you're just going to get zero and there's going to be anything interesting happening. So you need to actually be signed. And so in fact, when I wrote this, this is true as groups, but not as isometry of X modules. You need to twist this by a sign action. order to make this work correctly. So in order to make this part work correctly, we have to put in a sign action. And topologically, you can't do that without adding something that you can act on by plus or minus one. So you can't do that with a point. You can't act by plus or minus one on a point, but you can on a sphere. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a sign representation as a sphere. This is an S1 topologically. And we're going to take the product of that with this. And now this is actually correct. Um, and I'm going to be ignoring these signs. They're going to be floating around. It's not going to matter. It matters for actually making this work correctly. But other than that, it's going to turn out to not matter too much. It's, it's, it's an S1 with an, with an action that flips. If you think of S1 as you have a line, and here's our 0. And we have Z mod two, which acts via the sign representation. You can think of S one as the one point of actification of this. And this is S sigma. So notice it is pointed. This was a pointed thing for a smash product to work. This had better be a pointed thing. This is pointed by the pointed infinity. It's a space, so it's the uh, everything is spaces. I'm not doing any spectral. It's just the Cartesian product quotiented by the wedge. Nothing complicated. Yes. You really just need to have a good notion of what a subspace is. Um, and I mean, so. This isomorphism relies on the fact that any polytope or really any simplex can be written as can be represented by flags of vertex included into edge included into face and so on all the way up. And then like by for all the different orders that you can do this and you can represent that that's what this isomorphism relies on so if you have any kind of notion of all of that. Then this will work. Um, and I just don't want to write Euclidean but really anything where you can do that. Just say that an interval is. Yeah, so an interval is one point including into the line minus the other point including into the line. It's actually the whole line. It's the sign that tells you what side it's on. But yeah, that's exactly the intersection. Okay, so we have this, and now we have the topological model for it. And so this is step one. We've done step one. So now we can try to do step two, which is trying to topologize the Dane invariant. And for this, it's important to realize that what the Dane invariant is doing, as I said before, is breaking things down into a face followed by everything orthogonal to a face. So I'm not going to worry about signs. Just trust me that it all works. So if U is a subspace of X of dimension, K, I can define the youth Dane invariant, which is going to go from the building for X 
to the reduced join of the building for you and the building of the orthogonal complement of you. And when I say the orthogonal complement of you, here's what I mean. You can think of, for instance, hyper, you can think of hyperbolic spaces sitting inside, uh, you know, Rn plus one. And a subspace of it is just an intersection with an appropriate plane. That plane has an orthogonal complement that's going to be in a spherical geometry, which is as it should be because the Dane invariant went into a hyperbolic and the spherical thing. And so those are the sort of the two, the, what I mean by U perp. And the way that this works is I have a flag U0 all the way up to UI. And I map this to U0 through U and then reduce join, well, UJ, UJ plus one intersected with U perp, and then UI intersected with U perp. And I pick J such that UJ equals U. And I want it to be maximal. I don't want any silliness about oh, there's extra ones that are equal to it. I take the maximal J so it's equal to U, and then I stop at J, and that's a perfectly good flag inside this RT building. And then I intersect all the other ones with U perp, and UJ plus one is bigger than UJ, so that's going to be a proper non-empty subspace. And then going up to the whole thing, this is going to end up at U perp, and that lives in here. And obviously that only works if, if this J exists, and if this J doesn't exist, we just map it to the base. So this is this is the base. Ah, so this is this one. This is reduced join. And if you don't know what reduced join is. Feel free to just think of the join of two spaces where you take two spaces and you connect lines between each of them. That's what it is, pretty much, up to homotopy. And what it means for simplicial set is you literally take a simplex in the first part and then another simplex in the next part. And that's it. That's that's a simplicial model for the reduced join. And so this works. So notice this is well defined because these flags are exactly the type of thing we wanted. And moreover, every simplex for a fixed U, every simplex will match a non-base point thing exactly when U is contained in that simplex and not otherwise. So we can add this up over all of the different subspaces of a fixed dimension. There's only one non-zero. There's going to be a single non zero. So we can write DK, oh, wrong color. So this is our case Dane invariant. And you can do this for any dimension, and they all commute past each other. And you can see this because it's literally breaking up flags. If you break up the flag at space i and then at space j, that's the same as breaking it up at space j and then at space i. So now you're going to dignify this with a name. This is just a fact. Um, the di and dj commute past one another. So this gives us this vein cube. And I don't have time to prove this, but when you apply HN to this Dane cube, you get Sasha's Dane cube. So this is literally a, top, a topologization of this original object. Only now this is sitting in the bottom non-zero homology layer and there's a bunch more information in the higher homology. <laughs> Yes, this is the bottom one. Um, because this is has nothing below degree n minus one. So this is going to have nothing below degree n. And when you take homotopy co-invariance, the bottom degree doesn't, it might move up, but it's not gonna move down. 
So this is going to have be non-zero. This is going to be non-zero. The first one is going to be at H x. And so make sure that this is written. So the dimension of x. I'm sorry, I switched from n minus one to n minus one to n. I apologize. Um, okay, so we have this thing. So this is step two right here. Also, as a, a promise to other topologists, the join is homotopy equivalent to a suspension of a smash product. So for most topologists, including me, looking at the reduced join feels extremely unnatural. It is clearly wrong. It should obviously be a smash fire. We should have been, we, look, we have an extra suspension even floating around. It should have been, the, we suspended it and then we should have been able to do it with smash products. That's sort of the moral that, that comes out of this when you try to do it. This should be a smash product. And if somebody can construct a model of this that uses a smash product, I will be intensely grateful because Jonathan and I spent three months being like, this can't possibly be a join. It has to be a smash product, but the answer is no, it's a join. It really honestly seems to be a join. And the reason for this, and this is, if you don't, if you're not a homotopy theorist or don't work stably, don't worry about this, but the data invariant is an unstable phenomenon. When you stabilize, you lose orderings. And these flags are intrinsically ordered. When you stabilize, you lose the ordering and you can no longer split things up like this because you don't have it. And so anything that feels like it should be working stably like a smash product is not going to work because you are fundamentally losing the information that you need in order to construct this. So as far as we can figure out, this is really honestly, truly a join. Okay, so we've done step one, we've done step two, which is great, because I just erased them. But we did them. So now the next step is to do step three. And here, I'm just gonna, again, just tell you a fact, that if you wanted to apologize total complex, Thing to do is to take the total homotopy cofiber. And I'm going to explain what this is. So if you have a single map of groups and you want to make it into a chain complex where you're trying to keep track of the kernel and co kernel of this, you take this as a chain complex. You put this in degree one, this in degree zero. And the topologist, everything is graded homologically. If you have a map of spaces, so these are groups. You have a map of spaces and you want to be able to analyze the long exact sequence that it produces in homology. What you take here is you take X union the cone on A. So you here is X. And here is A, and you cone off A. So you add an extra point and you connect all of it to A. And now you've homotopically collapsed out A, and it gives you the correct thing. Now, suppose I can just label this up here. <laughs> groups. If you had two more groups and you want to take the total complex, what you can do is you can do this exact same construction. If you think of the cone on A as A sitting in degree zero and A sitting in degree one with the identity map, you can see that you can actually write this chain complex that I originally thought of as B union with the cone on A, morally speaking. So what you can do here is you can say, okay, now this is a chain complex A to B, and it's mapping to a chain complex C to D. And you can do the same construction to it. 
And what that will produce is A mapping to B plus C mapping to D, which is the total complex of the square. Now I'm going to wave my hands vigorously and say, and this keeps working. But similarly, if you have a square of spaces, you can take the cofiber here, so we'll call this F and G. You can take the cofiber here and it'll map to the cofiber of G. And then you can take the cofiber of that map. And that's the total homotopy cofiber. So in general, if you have a cube of spaces, you can start taking cofibers in each direction until you're left with a single space. And that is called the total homotopy cofiber, and that correctly corresponds to the total complex. So, if we want to topologize the total complex, what we want to do is take the total homotopy cofiber of the Dane cube. So this thing, the so what we want is the total Sophie cofiber of the thing. So far, I haven't been taking homotopy co-invariance. The nice thing about doing this topological construction is that homotopy co-invariants are a homotopy co-limit, and the total homotopy co-fiber is a homotopy co-limit. So they compute past each other. So this thing I have here where I wedged over all of the U's, I'm just doing this, I have this giant wedge. When I take the co-invariance, it will collapse down to a single example in each dimension. So it'll be exactly what we want it to be. But we can compute, instead of having to compute the co-invariance first and then the total homotopy cofiber, which is very intimidating, you can take the total homotopy cofiber first and then compute the co-invariance. Co-invariants are the scary part because you have a giant Lie group and you think of it as a discrete group. So we're doing that last. And the theorem is that the total homotopy cofiber of the Dane cube, and I'll do this, I'll say it for H2n minus one, but actually, this is going to work in vast generality. This is S2n minus two wedge this sign with the isometry group. Oh, I've been writing it as O. 2n minus 1. 1 acts here trivially. And it acts here by the sign. So we can now identify this. And moreover, when you have a sphere, and a group acts on it trivially, the homology of the co-invariance will just be the group homology of the group. So this means that the homology of this space this is just the homology h star minus 2n minus 1. Oh, no, this is an n minus 1, so it should be n minus, minus 2n, which is exactly what it is, of O 2n minus 1, 1 acting on Q twisted by the sine action. And that's what the, the twisted sphere is giving us. 
So now this big scary cube has just turned into a sphere which we can analyze. But more than that, when you're taking the total homotopy cofiber of a cube, there's a spectral sequence that starts at the homologies of the entries and converges to the uh, homology of the total homotopy cofiber, as one might expect. Actually, this is a good place to do it. So there exists a spectral sequence. which is concentrated in degrees zero through n minus one horizontally. And this is not drawn to scale, but it starts in degree two n. And over, so over here it's zero, over here it's zero, over here it's zero. And right here is the, so this is the E1 page. So this is the bottom non-zero thing. This is the Gontra complex. Made out of this total homotopy cofiber, this total complex of the scissors congruence groups and Dane invariants. And so we have a D1 going like this, and then we have D2 like this, and so on and so forth. So there's an edge homomorphism. So this converges to the homology of this orthogonal group. Um, and there's an edge homomorphism. In general, on this kind of homologically graded spectral sequence, there's an edge homomorphism which goes from when it converges to, so if there's a diagonal, it'll go from the value on the diagonal Place where it intersects the bottom. So this edge homomorphism, which I'm going to call theta m, so homology of n plus m of uh, messing up the degrees. This is theta minus two n, and this is going to be m plus n of O2n, star minus n, uh, 2n minus 1, 1 with these twisted coefficients. And it's going to end up at this homology of the Goncharov complex. So this is the map that I said at the beginning exists. It's this edge homomorphism. And you can say some more things. Oh, good. I have time. Good. So you have this edge homomorphism. This is going to be surjective exactly when all of the differentials above D1 are zero coming out of this row. So if you could prove that, this map would be surjective. And in fact, there would be a section going the other way. Um, so that's that. Moreover, you can actually compute these maps in terms of representatives, not like with actual real computations of the kind that folks have been giving, but more than nothing. And in particular, I'm not going to give you the general one. I'm just going to give you the specific one that we were interested in that ought to work with volume. So if we look at theta n minus one, this should go from h two n minus one of o two n minus one one down to this. So, and the thing that I said before also is that this commutes nicely with the volume. So how does this work? So 
you know, at the top level, there's just a single thing that was the top grading. So volume is perfectly well defined on that. The homology is going to be just the intersection of the kernels of all of the Dana variants, so it's still well defined. So this map is just volume. This map is a Cheater Turn Simons regulator. And the way that this works is if you were given G0, G1 through G2n minus one, this is a chain in here. What you do is you pick a point in H2n minus one. Uh, I'll just call this point x0. I'm going to mess this up if I don't. For a second, I thought my notes disappeared and that would have been scary. Um, where does it start? I wrote this down. Where did I write it down? Okay. I can no longer find it in my notes. I apologize. I'm going to hope that I got it right. I think I got it right. Um, so you pick a point x0 in there. And then you take the volume of the convex hull of x0, g2 and minus 1, x0, g2 and minus 1, g2 and minus 2, x0, and all the way down to g2 and minus 1, g0, x0. This is 2 and minus 2 endpoints. And h 2 n minus 1, so it gives you a simplex. You take its volume. That's um, this is the Cheeger turn Simons invariant. Um, and the fact that it factors through this is a computation of the edge homomorphism in that spectral sequence. You can, if you pick your representatives cleverly, you can actually trace how, how these points appear as you're going through the spectral sequence. So this converges because you take a simplex, which is defined by exactly these points, and then you take its volume, and that's exactly the definition of this. Um, and so that was what I wanted to say. Thank you for listening. This one? Which, yes. This one? Yeah. So it's so it goes into the this intersection of the kernels. And you can see that because sort of morally speaking, if you have a homology class in here, it has to close up. The being in the intersection of the Dana variance exactly means that you close up properly. And so it lands in there. Ideally, it would be surjective, and then again you would have a uh, section, which would also con uh, commute, and that would be one of uh, Sasha's uh, conjectures. Uh -huh. um, yeah, well, that's what you can say about it. And it's not, not that you know, we think it is because from the examples we've messed around with, it looks like in fact all differentials. So this that being surjective is equivalent to all differentials out of that right hand edge being zero above d one. It looks like in fact all differentials above out of that first row should be zero. Um, we haven't been able to prove that, but we, we very much think it's the case. Um, and I forgot to mention um, the conjecture that it's an isomorphism that I get that like this map that uh, Sasha conjectured just that it's an isomorphism is uh, equivalent to saying that certain that in e, the E infinity page, certain entries in the spectral sequence are zero. I mentioned at the beginning that the uh, Sasha uh, 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 so the, our methods will actually work over any field um and uh it doesn't say anything more about any field at the moment it this particular thing will uh, not work over any field but it'll work um, the this volume part, you need to have a notion of volume. So that part won't work over a finite field, for instance. But um, in general, uh, th these kinds of techniques will work over any field. 
And in fact, I've been using Q coefficients everywhere. You don't need Q coefficients. You need to invert two, but it'll work integrally after that. So it's not integrally, but I don't know what to call it. So the initial structure of work, the arrow was void in the other direction. Yes. Is there any heuristic which <coughs> suggests good, good going in the other direction? If we could show that the differentials up there were zero, it, that's the proof. Yes. I, uh, Sasha got, you should ask Sasha how he got his version. Um, definitely not me. Um, I, you know, I don't want to say, uh, I just ask Sasha, I don't know of any good reason what, how, about how you could reverse it. Other questions? So, so I have a question. So this geometric object is the same in, in this metaritical conjecture and in your system, right? This one? Yes. Yes. So what happens if you remove it and leave only the algebraic point? You will get diagram between the homology of O and homology of GL. Yes. And, uh, what, what, what kind of statement would you get? Can we prove it? So, I'm not 100% certain that I understand the question, but. Well, well, I mean, you combine these maps, compose the map. So you have a map. Oh, if you go. From h to n minus the, 1 of the, to, that. to that. Yeah, and there is for, you know, q bar. Huh, that's a good question. So then you are completely in the, in the algebra. world of algebra. So what, yeah. what, what is this? Can you describe independently? This? I have absolutely no idea. Um, yeah, so there's, so, okay. So if you work instead of, I've been working with real stuff because I wanted to, to make the connection to this very clear. If you work over the complex numbers, the way Sasha was working, you can do a little bit more because all of the different orthogonal groups are the same. So there's a hyperbolic map from GLN to O and N, uh, which sends a matrix M Long diagonal matrix containing M and M transpose inverse. And then there's a forgetful map. There's also a forgetful map to GL2N, where you just forget the fact that you were looking at orthogonal things and just remember the fact that they're invertible. And it's known that if you take, as you take N to infinity, uh, the fibers of these maps are the same up to a shift. So these are very closely related things. And my guess, I have not thought about this. So this is a complete guess. Do not quote me on this. But I would guess that this composition should be the composition, somehow the composition of these. But it, it's going in the other direction. So it should really be like, it goes from here to GL to it. And then you should end up in something which is representable by a lower dimensional matrix. So I would guess that that's how it would work. But this is a complete blind guess. But, but if this were true, could you use it to prove the original conjecture from starting from your stuff? If this were true, I don't know. I have absolutely no idea. So now it is. Uh, how about we start at five twenty five? What's the parade? I see one. Okay. 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 I think. Uh, right. You know, right. Uh, I think how is this helping? Right. Yeah, and I think it's free. Yeah, no, right. you open a book. So this probably so. Thanks. You should do some laboratory. Uh, 
Нет, там уже не так. Yeah, that's right. 